Welcome to The Spotlight, the podcast where veterans and military spouses connect and share how their military experience has transformed their lives and their businesses. Here's your host, Bob Lalvin. Hey, this is your host, Bob Lalvin, founder of the Veteran Crowd Network, the network that brings veterans and veteran-led businesses together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. And you are tuning into The Spotlight. Hi, everyone. This is Bob Lalvin, host of the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Today, uh, a very inspirational story. My guest is Aaron Hale of Extraordinary Delights. Aaron is a Navy and Army EOD veteran. He was uh, severely wounded in Afghanistan and is just an inspirational story for me. Aaron, I am very pleased to have you on the program today. Thank you for stepping into the spotlight. Thanks for inviting me. I am a chocolate lover. We're going to get into that, but I really would like for you to share with our guests, our listeners, your story. You you started out as as a Navy cook, but changed careers, and that has set you on a life path that nobody could have imagined well uh you know it actually started uh as soon as i could reach over the countertop uh i've been cooking it was my whole family is a it has a creative spark in them they're artists my mom is incredible painter and uh sketch artist so is my brother um my creativity that uh artistic streak led me into the kitchen I'm also a big fan of eating, so it worked out that way. Um, but uh, I also was a, an all-American slacker growing up. You know, I never had, um, never I had just enough natural talent and ability to not really have to work very hard at anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, of course, when I got to college, everybody who worked hard quickly passed me by. And uh, I found myself uh, um, not without any goals or ambition, um, nothing to strive for and no real um, uh, work ethic to get there if I did. So where did you where did you grow up and where did you go to college? uh, I was uh, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and I went to Bowling Green State University. Okay. So, so when, when did the uh, Navy come into play? Well, uh, after I got kicked out of college the second time, um, and I lost my freshman 50, uh, (laughs) I, I, I needed, it was, it was, it was, it was one of those, um, you know, uh, come to Jesus moments and one of those, uh, kick in the pants type of things where I was like, was really embarrassed about, uh, getting kicked out of school for academics and um, wasting a, a ton of tuition uh, just drinking drinking beer. So mm-hmm. I, I I decided I needed to needed to get on a path. I needed to you know I needed to do something with my life. Uh, so I mean my, my entire life up until about well, a month before I enlisted, I absolutely knew I was never going to be in the military. <laughs> um, but when considering my options, I wanted to go back to school, I wanted to go back to college and do it right. But I had to decide what direction. And I decided since I loved cooking, I want to be a chef. But, you know, tuition being gone, I needed to find a way to pay for it. And the military offered the GI Bill. I could do my, my four years. And the recruiter even told me, uh, I could get at that time it was full tuition assistance while I was in, and of course the, t- the recruiter was like, "You can take as many courses as you want while you're in." But uh, um, I, I decided I was going to do my four. You you, get you, out. you you must have been good at it because after a few years you were cooking for the admiral in Italy. Yeah, uh, well, you know. I really took to military service, uh, surprised me uh, quite a bit and my folks that I was learning, you know, all the, you know, 
leadership and and I was getting promoted quickly and uh, soon soon enough I was extending um, my my enlistment and yeah uh, I, I was I was sent to um, cook for you know, the pri- in the private mess of the you know commander of the sixth fleet in Gaia to Italy and I spent four years in Italy that was amazing because you know Italy uh, uh, right you know, on duty we we you know cruise around the mediterranean uh every few days just you know pull into a foreign port run up the flag and throw a party on the flight deck and you know, off duty i was i was traveling around europe in in italy uh, it was it was incredible what what <clears throat> to uh to uh, come over to the you know the senior service from the navy to the army tell everybody about the story about uh, uh becoming uh, interested in eod uh, my first deployment to afghanistan i was still a cook uh it, both wars were happening and i realized when i was cooking for the admiral that i was wa- still like floating around the mediterranean uh watching war happening on the television you know, i was watching i was i was in the service but war was you know, i all i knew really of war was uh, off of cnn and it, there was just something calling to me i wanted to do something more with my my skills my talents and even though i enjoyed cooking and i loved you know, serving uh, in europe I just I, I I knew that I needed to do something more, uh, and the best I could do from um, a Navy cook position was volunteer as an individual augmentee, uh, and run a chow hall uh, on on a on a fob in Afghanistan. So right. I I I uh, volunteered and deployed and spent a year in Farah, Afghanistan, and when I was there. Uh, I, I met a couple EOD techs that were doing their preventive maintenance checks uh, on all their gear out of their truck one day. And if you can imagine the, the armored truck and they had all this gears, you know, laid out in, uh, out back of it. And there's the, the, the bomb suit, the robots, you know, all that kind of gear. And it was like a cool guy garage sale. So, uh-huh. uh, I struck up a conversation with these guys, learned all about the tight-knit brotherhood, the technical aspect of the job, uh, the fact that they're first responders, lifesavers on the battlefield. I mean, everything just clicked right into place, and that's what I knew I needed to do. So I put in a chip uh, request uh, in the Navy to go to strike, to, to switch jobs at the MOS. Uh, from from cook to EOD in the Navy, and they said no. Mm. Uh, I guess they like my cooking too much, right? But, uh, um, and that it, the truth truth was at that time, um, EOD wasn't its own rate or job description. It was a specialty, a qualification, and you had to come from certain source jobs, and they just they weren't taking cooks. You had to be like a bosun's mate or a, a master at arms or something along those lines. Where, where did you end up going for training with the Army uh, for EOD school then? Um, well, once I decided to switch from Navy to the Army, uh, just to, to, to get into the EOD field, the Army sent me to Fort Sill to do um, a program that I don't believe still is uh uh, is happening but it was a warrior transition course it was right. for prior prior service uh, uh members that were joining the army either the first time or had been out for a few years and um it's a it's a truncated version of basic training yeah uh, uh, all the technical aspect less of the indoctrination and right. Uh, so I did that. Then they sent me to Redstone Arsenal for the Army's Phase One uh, EOD training, and then Phase Two is the Joint training, so Joint uh-huh. Services uh, at Eglin Air Force Base. That's uh, Navy run school. So you go back to Afghanistan, and this is sort of where the story begins, really. 
So I changed uniforms, uh, went to uh, Iraq once, and then I went back to Afghanistan in 2011, and this time as an EOD team leader. And I spent eight very busy months uh, pretty much running uh, IEDs, pressure plate IEDs every single day. And uh, <clears throat> on December, December 8th, 2011, uh, one of them had my name on it. This uh, is oh, 10, oh, this oh. is 10 years ago next week. Exactly right. Okay. So tell everybody about what happened. Uh, I was just back from uh, my two weeks of R&R &R, uh, stateside, got to see my, my, my son turn one, got to see the whole family for Thanksgiving, which uh, it was quickly find out was my favorite, favorite mm. uh, holiday. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I got to put that, uh, the, the most excellent last page in the, the scrapbook, you know, the photo album. And uh, my, my team picked me up in my our armored truck from the airfield, and we jumped in a logistics convoy to head back out to our operation, our area of operation. Along the way, there was a call, a roadside IED. So I tossed the luggage off of the robot, the robot out of the truck, and it got to work. And we had the components of another pressure plate ID pulled apart, but I needed to get as much evidence as I safely could from the scene. So because the thing had been separated, there was no need to get into the bomb suit. So I had the standard uh, body armor on. Mm. I jumped out with a metal detector and an evidence kit, and I started making my approach in about 20 or 30 meters from the original there was a secondary device that had well, do, do, do you think that that was was remotely detonated by somebody who was watching the site or or was hmm. it triggered by something else uh the secondary device is most likely another pressure plate it just hadn't been found right um, ironically they're less than half a mile away from that that site on this this road was the only uh, RC remote control IED that we run in Afghanistan that entire deployment. Right. So uh, that was on my mind. Mm. Uh, so I, so um, you lose your sight as a result of that, but no limbs, but you couldn't see. Yeah, well, I was I was <laughs> to get you know my bell rung and the lights go out. And I land on my knees and elbows, and, and, but I'm still awake. I don't know how lucid I am, but I'm still conscious. And my first thought immediately was, um, what's going on around me? You know, I thought that my, my, my helmet had just gotten pushed over my, my face. But um, I'm thinking, okay, uh, ambush, attack, what's going to happen next? Who's... Mm -hmm. Who's who's on a cordon and looking in at what just happened rather than looking out and what my team is supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be clearing a safe path to me so the medics can get in. And all this going on, but I am on my knees and I first thing I do is the functions check, wiggle the fingers and the toes, then I reach up to to get the the fix the helmet and get back to work. It, find out that the helmet is gone. So that's when I thought, oh man, this is bad. Right. My first, my first sergeant's going to kill me. <laughs> Lost my hat. <laughs> losing, <laughs> losing, yeah, losing my helmet. Where's your cover? Okay. Honor, duty, service. At the Veteran Crowd Network, we're focused on our next mission, bringing veterans, veteran-operated businesses, and veteran service organizations together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. That's why we are launching the Veteran Crowd Rewards Program exclusively for our individual and corporate members. Now you can save on travel, restaurants, goods, and services from brands you trust online and at over 900,000 locations nationwide. Find out more today at VeteranCrowdNetwork.com. If you are a veteran, a veteran-operated business, or a VSO, 
consider the connections, the network, the benefits, the engagement, and success of working with other veterans again. The Veteran Crowd Network, you paid a lot of dues to join this club. Folks, you're listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Our guest is Aaron Hale, the founder of Extraordinary Delights, and we're hearing his story about how he lost his sight in Afghanistan almost 10 years ago mm -hmm. this week. Uh, Aaron, you come back home and start the rehab process, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, you, you're getting back into life uh, pretty aggressively. Uh, you're doing some interesting things, running, uh, hiking. Uh, you have a, you had a great deal of resilience after this accident, but it's not the end of the story, right? So, so tell everybody a little bit about what you were doing for sort of the four-year period, and then we'll get into what happened, what, around 2015. I was, uh, you know, of course, the injury happened. I'm back in uh, Walter Reed, and uh, you, you know, those demons try to get in. You know, the what ifs, the why me's, that kind right. of stuff. And I was feeling down on myself, but it, um, I'm in a hospital full of warriors, and the, my military training, my military experience, all that teamwork, and that the, the resilience on the battlefield. Um, I quickly snapped out of it and realized I can't let these guys down. I mean, I can't be the guy you know, that lets my team down. I mean, why would I do that now? And of course, even if I, mean, I found out that I was going to be 100% blind for the rest of my life, but even though um, I'd going down uh i'm still alive mm -hmm. and i still have a job to do both you know personal life and military you know i wear these hats and i got i have a responsibility my life isn't just my own it doesn't belong to me so i decided right there if i was going to be blind i was going to be the best damn blind guy i could be and i just i, I started first learning how to be blind and I was sent to one of the VA's uh, blind rehabilitation centers. And they taught me how to use, uh, you know, the, the computers and the talking phones and barcode scanners and the cane and that kind of stuff. And then I started, as soon as I could get on the internet, I started researching, I started like going to Google and asking, you know, put typing in blind plus anything blind plus running blind plus skiing blind plus whatever a few names started popping up like eric weinmayer who's um uh, the first blind person to ever climb mount everest and i sought him out and i climbed a mountain with him and then yeah, in fact i joined an all wounded veteran team up a eighteen thousand foot peak in the peruvian andes in 2013 and uh to get ready for that i started running and, you know, of course, in Florida, it's really hard to find a decent mountain to train on. But right. uh, um, at least I could get out and run. And I started running with, with guides. And then I was running marathons. Um, and um, I learned about a guy named uh, Lonnie Bedwell, another uh, Navy veteran, who uh, is the first blind person to kayak the entire Grand Canyon in a solo boat. And if he could do that, I could do. I, mean, I could do something. I can get. I could stay off the the couch. Uh, so I, I sought him out, and we went kayaking together. Did class three rapids on the Yellowstone. And I so, and, these, but I, I think you went on a hiking trip and and came back and all of a sudden fell sick. Though, right? Is that is that the right chronological order? Yeah. Um, uh, in 2015, summer of 2015, I contracted bacterial meningitis, and it's it's a waterborne uh, bacteria. So I'm guessing it came from maybe one of my kayaking trips. It's 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 really just speculation. It could have been anything, mm -hmm. but um, uh, yeah, almost four years after the blast, complications from that the, the damage from the blast because it was actually. Um, we suspect uh, there was a cracks in my skull because not only did I lose my, my eyes, but I'd cracked my skull. So I was leaking spinal right. fluid. And 
um, it had been patched, but I guess not completely or it reopened. And a pathway out is a pathway in. And, and the bacteria was attacking my brain. When, when, when does Michaela come on the scene? Almost at the exact time um, the, uh, the meningitis did. Michaela, Michaela uh, and I have known each other really since childhood. Um, our mothers were childhood friends. Right. And um, while her mom raised her kids in uh, Colorado, my mom raised you know, us kids in Akron, Ohio. But her mom would take Michaela and her, her sisters in the minivan across country through Ohio back to Baltimore where they, they grew up. And um, if so every summer, uh, I, I've, known, I've known Michaela since she was like five years old. Um, but I'd struck up a conversation you know, on social media, there was phone calls and then, you know, that kind of thing. And Michaela was living and working in California. I was actually at the time, I think I'd, yeah, I'd retired, but I was a speaker in, um, in Florida and I convinced her to come out for a week long vacation slash first date. And we had this great time. Uh, but you know, after the week, we just had an amazing, amazing first week date. And she had to get back to work. So did I. Uh, and then a few days later, boom, I'm in the hospital with meningitis. I don't think Michaela even unpacked, had unpacked her bags yet. She turned right back around from Sacramento and flew back out to California. And she was there before the rest of my family were by my side in the hospital. And um, I, while I was fighting for my life again and after after some time in the hospital you know i got to come back home um the the meningitis took what was left the 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 of uh, my hearing that the bomb blast didn't take uh so i was totally deaf totally blind i'd actually lost my inner ear sense of balance so yeah. i came home in a wheelchair and i was now using the trekking poles i was uh i took into the mountains just to get to the mailbox and back. I couldn't get on my treadmill because it balanced. And mm -hmm. so it was a pretty, pretty rough time. And Michaela stayed while well, the rest of my family came and had to get had lives to get back to. She took a leave of absence from her job and she moved in and she nursed me back to health. In fact, Michaela figured out a way to communicate with you because your your implants didn't work. Your cochlear implants didn't work. So tell everybody that story. I, I got to tell you, you yeah. found an angel in Michaela. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, about this time, since I was blind and deaf, I, I thought maybe I should have learned Braille, but uh, mm. technology being what it was, uh, it's kind of a dying art. Uh, so... Um, I couldn't read Braille and who, who in the world knows the, that poem sign language that uh, um, Helen Keller used. So mm. uh, uh, I was really, there was no way to communicate with me except Michaela and I, and Michaela started writing every single letter of every single word in, of course, you know, like army block letters for me uh, to understand. And that's how she would get a message in. It was long, it was tedious, it was frustrating, but that was the only way somebody could talk to me. And it was perfectly silent uh, and totally dark. So she uh, was my connection to the outside world and probably my saving, saving grace at that time because it was, you know, you know the, again, those what if, the why me's, the, the demons were right there. You know, right there. I, I, I was I was thinking you know, like oh gosh when um has one guy paid his dues when when um what is one you know when if I paid how much can share? one person be asked to do you you made a great life decision asking her to marry you uh no 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 regrets at all she's she's just amazing she's a wonderful wife and and a terrific terrific mother um and business partner and friend so so, so 
Yeah. And let's let's talk about the business. We've spent 20 minutes talking about your story, but you know, now you've created this business. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a fantastic video, your story on the internet, um, talking about uh how she sort of created the business around one of your passions yeah. which and by the way your fudge sounds absolutely indescribably delicious if we had not such a short fuse on on our getting together i would have gotten some in advance of our call today but i don't have my hands on any of it yet but i plan to get some tell everybody about the uh, about the fudge because i think you started cooking around a, a holiday again is that how it started? Well, as I mentioned, Thanksgiving was my my favorite is my favorite holiday. I mean, one you get to gather uh, your friends and family around and tell people what you're grateful for. I mean, what better reason? Um, two, you get to eat like a glutton. Uh, so, um, I it's, it was it was it would be six months before I'd be able to have a cochlear implant that would work. And so that was a really long and hard time to be in such isolation. Uh, I mean, I, I know, cannot two, imagine. I cannot you know, imagine. People complain about 2020 and um, the, the, the like the quarantine times. I'm like, right. Man, I know what you feel. I know how you feel. I've been there. Um, <laughs> not my first, not my first rodeo. Anyways, right. uh, uh I decided to take the focus off of myself, stop worrying about me and what I've lost. And then I was good. Thanksgiving was coming. And you know what? We're, it was, it was kind of like that, that first decision. If I'm going to be in this situation, I'm going to make it the best I can. So Thanksgiving's coming, whether I like it or not, or I'm, I'm happy or not. So might as well like it and be happy. <laughs> so um, I decided to, we were going to invite everybody the family friends neighbors we in, actually invited some stranded eod students um that uh you know didn't go uh back home for the holidays right. but they you know sometimes they don't have enough leave or you know, money saved up uh or they're just you know saving their time for christmas for the holidays so we invited some eod students and uh and it was going to be a huge feast and i, I started weeks in advance and it was going to be the best feast I've ever created. And I started with the, the you know, desserts, cakes and pies and cookies. And I started doing like a batch of fudge and then another batch of fudge. And I was like throwing nuts and spices. I was going to the liquor cabinet. And, <laughs> uh, and, and my, Michaela, uh, she noticed two things. One, um, First thing, first time she'd seen it in six months was a smile on my face. I was having a good time. I was actually wasn't I wasn't like constantly thinking about the disabilities and what I'd lost. I was I was immersed in the cooking and in the holidays, and I was happy. The other thing she noticed was way too much fudge. <laughs> it was just piling up. So she started taking it and sneaking it out the front door. Like you got to be real stealthy around a blind deaf guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she started giving it away and people began coming back to her and saying, can we buy more of this for our birthday party or shower or whatever? And the capitalist in me said, well, of course you may. And all of a sudden we had this business and we decided to name it uh, after you know, my my job in the military, EOD. Right. Well, right. We'll play on words there, but extraordinary delights instead of explosive ordinance. Yeah. So now it's EODfudge.com. We are going to put links to uh, to all of this in the show notes. Do you, tell me this: what's what does the future hold? Looking forward, what have you got on your plate for the next six to twelve months? Well, uh, in truth, we we've had a, quite a bit of success with uh, extraordinary delights, and that's afforded us the ability to chase more of our passions. 
Michaela became a real estate agent and is uh, selling and buying, you know, helping people buy and sell homes in the Florida Panhandle. Uh, I'm also passionate about real estate and we are, I, I tell people we sell fudge to buy real estate. Um, uh, we've got uh, rentals back in my, my uh, hometown of Akron, Ohio. Um, started a, a uh, real, real estate wholesaling business in Pensacola with a fellow wounded Navy buddy. Uh, and, you, do you live in the Pensacola area? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in Santa Rosa Beach, not far okay. from um, Eglin. Okay. And my partner is in Pensacola. Gotcha. Well, I'm very familiar with Pensacola. I haven't had a son go through there. So uh, what, a, what a great part of the country. It, it, so I'm, I'm curious what last week was like. What did you do this Thanksgiving? Did you throw it down also on Thanksgiving this, this past week? You know, uh, this Thanksgiving, we visited some friends in uh, Nantucket. And oh. uh, it was great because, of course, no matter where I go, they kind of expect me to, to cook the bird. <laughs> so <laughs> we, I cooked at somebody else's home. Um, we had a terrific time and visited uh, friends. It was This was more of a cozy Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. but uh, it was nice. What, what's your favorite way to cook a turkey? Do you deep fry it or do you bake it? Uh, actually, one of my favorite ways, I, I do really do appreciate uh, a good fried turkey, but um, uh, I love doing it in the smoker. Ah, okay. But no matter what way I do it, uh, fried, roast, smoke, whatever I, I always let uh, my turkey set uh one or two nights in brine you got just, it you don't after you brine a turkey you don't go back right my my wife is the cook in our house and i tell you she <laughs> she she found a new recipe we, we basically coated the thing in butter uh but with with uh with a mix of uh various herbs that she got me to chop up but it was delicious uh one final question tease me and our our listeners with some of the fudge chocolate varieties that you've got because and you've you've got some interesting i think one of them was a berry white uh but anyway i'm i'm just curious about the various flavors that you've developed that are the hot items the hot sellers for christmas here well no, like you mentioned one is uh called strawberry right uh, berry white um, and because it's uh, it's a mix of um, light and you know white and darker chocolates and strawberry, uh, and it's uh, super smooth. <laughs> mm, yeah. um, we've got our triple threat a signature triple threat chocolate. Uh, it's made with three different chocolates. Um, uh, our walnut chocolate walnut. And there's also oh, a man. double layer of. of you know, white chocolate, caramel, and peanut butter fudge. And one of my favorites is, <clears throat> one of my favorites is, is actually a pretty original uh, recipe of mine uh, based on my experiences in Italy and tiramisu. So ah. uh, tiramisu literally in Italian means pick me up. So, you know, it's got, you uh, know, tiramisu has uh, coffee, cocoa, and alcohol in it. So, you know, definitely the best pick-me-up. So uh, what I did is I made an all-American version or what we call American pick-me-up. American. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, two layers. Top layer is white chocolate and bourbon cream with... Uh, <clears throat> In, instead of like uh, you know, amaretto or frangelico bourbon cream, and then instead of hazelnuts, it's toasted pecan, and then the lower layer layer is the dark chocolate with uh, American uh, American Pride Roasters coffee. So, uh, if people get on the website today, they can still get some of your fudge for Christmas. We uh, we got time. Well, yes, but they'll have to hurry since um, we 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 made uh, we did our production line 
And then we uh, su were surprised by an invite to the Rachel Ray show. Ah. And, uh, there was a run on our website. And um, though we were able to do an extra run of product, like make more product uh, fudge and the other traits, it's quickly running out. So it, not only do you want to get it so you can ship some time, but you might want to go uh, right now before we run out. There you go. Uh, tell everybody again the website. EODFudge.com eodfudge.com there you have it well, folks we are out of time i i tell you what I, I love this opportunity because i get to meet people like you you are aaron you are a sincere uh, inspiration um i you know i might even start calling you aa ron uh just just to poke at you a little <laughs> bit here's here's one last question for you uh Next week is the Army Navy game. Who's going to win? Oh, man. Um, I'm always torn because I always consider myself an Army soldier. Uh, an but, Army soldier. <laughs> but I think, I think Army's going to win. Okay. There you go. Okay. Well, there it is, folks. Well, folks, you've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Our guest has been Aaron Hale. Aaron, I want to get some of that fudge in my hands. Uh, would love also, you are a sincere inspiration to me, listeners out there. Happy holidays to you. Thank you so much. I'll throw out an Army Bravo Zulu to you for your <laughs> performance. It's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at veterancrowdnetwork.com. We'll see you next time.